Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you to our 10th Annual Educational Law and Social Justice Forum. Uh, this evening's event is sponsored by the Center for Educational Pluralism, uh, together with the Journal of Educational Controversy. And uh, it is also being co-sponsored with the American Democracy Project, the Center for Service Learning here at Western, and the American Civil Liberties Union of Washington State. My name is Lorraine Casperson, and I'm the editor of the uh, Journal of Educational Controversy, as well as uh, a faculty member here at, at Western. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce my co-moderator, uh, Kristen French, at the end of the table here. Uh, Kristen is the new director of the Center for Educational Pluralism, and uh, she will be taking your questions at the end and engaging you in a real interesting discussion with our, with our three panelists. Tonight's event um, really marks an anniversary for us. It was 10 years ago that uh, Woodring College actually started these forums, um, and our purpose was to bring the big questions in education before the public and have an opportunity to discuss some of these issues in, in greater depth. Two years ago, we decided to expand the conversation by creating an online international journal where these issues can be explored with scholars and practitioners from across the nation and across the globe. Uh, we're now, by the way, read in over 100 nations, so we're really becoming quite visible in the last two years. Um, <laughs> thanks to all of the wonderful writers we've had and our editorial board and the support we've had from Woodring College. Uh, last spring, we decided that we would use the forums to invite the authors whose articles we are publishing in the journal uh, to come and discuss their ideas. And so this evening, we have three authors who published articles in our winter 2008 issue that focused on the topic, schooling as if democracy really matters. Uh, we'd like to invite you to read the articles in our issue, and unfortunately, I have to say that I tried, but I wasn't able to get it online in time for the forum this evening. Uh, we were you know, for as a new journal, we were really inundated with manuscripts and quite surprised by, by the flood of manuscripts we got. So uh, it will go online shortly, and we invite you to read all of the, of the articles around, the, around that issue. Uh, our journal tries to generate the conversation by posing a controversy that we ask people then to respond to. In our winter issue, we, pro we posed the following scenario. We said, in this issue, we consider how we are to fulfill the traditional moral imperative of our schools to create a public capable of sustaining the life of a democracy. How do we do this in the age of the Patriot Act uh, and other uh, uh, acts, the NSA surveillance, uh, extraordinary rendition, uh, preemptive wars, uh, enemy combatants, uh, all likely to involve violations of civil rights and liberties and a curtain of government secrecy. What story do we tell our young about who we are, who we have been, and who we are becoming? How do we educate children about their identity in this global world? Um, I really sh ah there we go. Not able to see all this. Um, what sense are they to make of the imperial democracy that they are inheriting? Is our new political environment a fundamental break with the past, or an extension of long-standing trends? What are the implications of these forces for the education of the young? in the foundations of our democracy and our collective identity. We will be 
eventually publishing about 30 articles that come at this question with many different perspectives. Our authors tonight approach the theme, schooling as if democracy matters, by examining the issues surrounding three topics, democracy and race, democracy and rights, and democracy and schooling. I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. And uh, by the way, you have more information uh, about them in your program. Uh, and then I'll ask each to talk about the article that they wrote, and two of them will be doing a, a PowerPoint presentation for you. Uh, following that, Dr. French will begin the questioning and then take questions from the audience. So first, discussing the theme of democracy and race is Professor William Lyne. Professor Lyne is, is a professor of English and African American studies. Uh, professor Lyne is right next to Christian French. Um, he is a professor of English and African American studies at Western Washington University and is the editor of uh, an anthology called Wake, Walking the Talk, an anthology of African American studies. He teaches courses in American literature, African American literature, and cultural studies. His article was called Beautiful Losers. Interesting title. Beautiful Losers. And in it, he examines the historical relationship between education and democracy and the possibilities for progressive action within today's education issue, uh, system. Uh, Professor Line, by the way, is also a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Educational Controversy. Discussing the theme of democracy and student rights is Aaron Kaplan, who's sitting right next to uh, Bill Line. Uh, Aaron Kaplan is a staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union. And as an ACLU attorney, Mr. Kaplan represents clients directly in constitutional litigation and provides advice and counseling to members of the public and attorneys with civil liberties questions. Beginning in the fall of 2008, Aaron will join the faculty of Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, where he will be teaching constitutional law and civil procedure. His article in the issue was called Visions of Public Education in Morse v. Frederick. Um, the article looks at the Supreme Court's recent decision last spring that dealt with a case of a high school principal who suspended a student for a banner that promoted illegal uh, drug use. Aaron places the case against a historical background of Supreme Court decisions on student rights and examined the visions of public education that animated these decisions. And to discuss democracy and the actual classroom, we have an actual teacher. <laughs> Uh, Val Hartley is a teacher at the Whatcom Day Academy in Bellingham, Washington, where she teaches 8 to 12-year-olds. I might just add that the Whatcom Day Academy, in partnership with the Woodring College of Education, are members of the League of Democratic Schools. It's a project that was started by John Goodlad at the University of Washington. The League is a network of schools across the nation that is attempting to create model schools that are laboratories for democratic practices. Our winter issue, incidentally, was dedicated to John Goodlatte, who wrote uh, the prologue for, it, for us. Vell's article is entitled, The Elementary Classroom, a Key Dimension of a Child's Democratic World. Her article describes her own journey in applying democratic principles to the classroom and in it, she gives an example of the power of student voice, a rationale for championing the cause of democratic education, ideas about what democratic dis uh, dispositions include, and classroom strategies to use with students. As she puts it, quote, all of us, children and adults, can be invited to take part in a human conversation, end quote. So I'd like to welcome all of our panelists this evening. Thank you. I think we'll start with um, Aaron Kaplan, who's going to talk about 
uh, democracy and student rights. So, good evening, everyone. Um, as uh, Professor Casperson said, I am an attorney at the ACLU of Washington. And in my time there, I've had the privilege of representing a number of high school students who've gotten in trouble with their principals, often because of what they write on their websites or uh, other, other opinions that they wanted to express. The, um, the case that was uh, recently decided by the U.S. Supreme Court didn't involve the Internet, but it involved uh, a student who had a banner that said, Bong Hits for Jesus, and found himself suspended from school for two weeks for displaying it. Um, in trying to understand how a court would approach a problem like that, I realized that there is often a connection between what a court thinks education is about and what law they are going to make to resolve the case. Um, I know this isn't a, a legal audience, so I won't uh, get too technical on any, of the, uh, on any of the law parts. But as we will see, there has been a long history of when courts are presented with a question about uh, what's the right legal answer, they will look back to their collective knowledge or collective ideas about what education is supposed to look like and then model their legal answers to that. So the idea of knowing, uh, you know, developing a sense uh, throughout our society and including in our judges of what school is for helps us determine what sort of legal results we're going to get. So our story is uh, going to start with a familiar scene to most of us, which is uh, students reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, this is something that has been going on since sometime in the late 19th century, was when the pledge was first written. This photo is actually from 1899, a familiar looking scene, although some of the details are different. You may notice that uh, nowadays people will put their hand over their heart this way, and all of these students have it slightly uh, more pointed out to the front. Uh, in a slightly more military looking uh, approach. Now, um, <clears throat> not everybody likes reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, including, uh, in particular, earlier in our history, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that uh, allegiance is something that is owed only to God, and uh, they're not going to take an oath uh, to a nation or a flag. So this is the Gobitis family, from Minersville, Pennsylvania. Uh, the two children uh, didn't want to say the Pledge of Allegiance in class, and uh, they were suspended from school as a result of it. Uh, the family went to court, and ultimately the case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, where the court uh, sort of asked, uh, as the, the big question in the case is, when, does individual, when do individual constitutional rights require that people have an exemption from something that everybody else has to do? Now, to answer this question, the majority of the Supreme Court, they actually ruled, I believe it was eight to one, that it was proper to expel these kids from school for not reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. And how they got there uh, was through some reasoning that, that revealed a little bit about what they thought about schools. Okay, uh, They uh, started out by saying what schools are for is to develop citizenship. And I think that's a concept that pretty much all of the later court cases agree with. You know, we, we send people to school so that they will be good citizens. Now, where there's all, always been differences is, well, what is good citizenship and how do you get there? Uh, what the majority of the court said in Gobitis is, well, good citizenship is something that comes f from when everyone believes the same things. We have cohesive sentiment. We have common beliefs and common interests. 
And in other words, you, freedom and good citizenship come from conformity. You know, we want people to be saying the same things and believing the same things uh, or else our society is going to fall apart. So conformity is what gets you freedom. That's, that's what they said and that's what they thought schools were for. Uh, as the majority mentioned, you know, they see this as a type of societal self-protection. Uh, you know, in order to protect society, they have to have unconscious feelings that bind men together in comprehending loyalty. You know, so, so conformity and uh, group loyalty is what they thought citizenship was about. Um, and they mentioned that, you know, saying the Pledge of Allegiance is just one of those compulsions that comes along with schooling. There's all sorts of things that are compulsory in schooling, and this is going to be one of them. Now, one interesting thing about the opinion is, as you'll see in this quote, they, uh, they claim to say, we aren't taking a position on whether requiring the kids to say the Pledge of Allegiance is a good idea or not. You know, uh, it's not our decision. Uh, it's for the school to decide whether this is a good idea or not. However, uh, in between the lines, they made really clear that they thought saying the Pledge of Allegiance was a great idea <laughs> because they said it mocks reason and denies our whole history for people to say that there's something wrong with the Pledge of Allegiance. And they said, uh, you know, there are some crazy people out there who say that saluting the flag gives the seeds of sanction for obeisance to a leader. Now think about what that means. This is 1940. They're talking about Hitler. They're talking about Mussolini. And they say even though uh, you know, having the kids all pledge allegiance, um, you know, it, it might look a little totalitarian to some of you, but that's crazy talk. It's not totalitarian. Uh, it mocks reason to think that. So if that's what you think about schools, what are you going to do legally with this? Well, you know, legally they said the flag salute is something that can be led in schools. Um, and that the schools are not required to make exceptions for anybody, even if they have religious objections to doing it. And they said, well, why can't there be any exceptions? And again, they said something kind of remarkable. It says, well, if we started giving an exception to you, the Jehovah's Witnesses, it might cast doubts in the minds of the other children about whether saying the Pledge of Allegiance is a good thing or not. So, gee, if we let you express your opinion, all of these other people might start developing opinions that call into question what we're doing. Uh, and so that was the uh, result of that case. So it's a very particular view of what school is all about. Um, now, this ended up being a, a fairly controversial case. There were two different types of reactions to it in different communities. In some communities, they thought it was great decision and actually saying the Pledge of Allegiance is, it needs more attention than we've been giving it. We've been lax in teaching our students about proper patriotism. And so, for instance, West Virginia, they passed a law that said, you know, before I think in West Virginia it was just sort of classroom by classroom. Now it says everybody's got to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. If a student doesn't say it, we're going to declare them delinquent, which could be you know, your award of the state and taken away from your family's home. The parents can be fined or imprisoned if they let their kids not say the pledge. Yeah, another reaction that happened in some different communities was, hey, we are not uh, comfortable with forcing kids to say something that they don't truly believe. And in fact, the state of Washington was one of those where our Supreme Court went a different way. They said, we are not going to require people to recite the Pledge of Allegiance if it's not what they believe. Um, <clears throat> are, we care more about freedom of, of uh, religion and individual conscience than this Gobitis case was. Now, another thing uh, started to change in the years immediately after this, and it goes back to what I was pointing out before about you know, how does this, what does this flag salute look like? In fact, for a lot of the early 20th century, this is what the flag salute looked like, okay? <clears throat> we salute the flag, you put your hand up. Uh, I believe this picture was taken sometime in the 1930s, and this is just how it was done. Well, with the onset of World War II, uh, and people saw more and more film footage of what was going on in Germany, and they said, hey, we're, we're doing this Heil Hitler thing, that's, that's not so great. Actually, in 1942, Congress passed a law that said, 
if you're doing the Pledge of Allegiance, um, you put your hand over your heart. Uh, Congress never required anyone to say it, but they had a statute that says, here's the right way to say it if you're going to do it. And so they changed it from this more militaristic pose to this more sort of heartfelt, contemplative pose. But there was definitely some thinking going on in society at large about, hey, what is this whole flag salute? So what, we, what then happened is there was another case uh, challenging this West Virginia law that I told you about. And some of the members of the Supreme Court changed their mind, and now it came out in the other direction, that yes, the schools must not punish students who opt out of the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, so Justices Black and, and Douglas, and this is William O. Douglas, who's originally from Yakima, um, you know, they were explaining why they changed their position, and as they point out here, hey, just because you're going to get some eight-year-old and force them to say something, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're feeling the patriotic thoughts that we want. So the majority opinion in Barnett has a completely different view of what schools are about. Uh, they said a couple of things. First off, <clears throat> you know, there, there's no school board exception to the Constitution. All government agencies, including school boards, have to obey the First Amendment. And then they said, they, they didn't say that school was, it, the purpose of school was to create conformity. They said the opposite. Uh, they said, we're educating them for citizenship, and that, and that means we need to treat them like citizens when they're in school. If we have a sort of totalitarian school and we say to students, you're living a free society, you must do this, then the students are going to think this is hypocrisy. Um, you know, they will discount these important principles if it's being taught at a school that doesn't honor uh, freedom. They talked a little bit about, they didn't say Germany specifically, but they sort of said, hey, we don't like what we're seeing in totalitarian countries. And they mentioned that this was 1943, we're in the middle of the war. And then they talk a little bit about, well, you know, what is a truly American school system going to look like? And they talk about individualism, they talk about cultural diversity, having the freedom to differ. And they said, you know, national unity and patriotism is great, but you're only going to get that by leading by example. You can't force people uh, to be patriotic. Well, so if that's what you think a school is, the legal principles that are going to follow from that is, you know, yes, you do have to give exceptions for people. And this is a very famous quote that comes from this case that lawyers and judges use all the time. That basically, no official can prescribe what is orthodox, in politics, and you can't force people to confess their faith. Uh, it needs to be left to individual judgments. So two different views of what school is about leads to two different legal rules. Well, let's fast forward a few years. Uh, the next big case that the U.S. Supreme Court dealt with uh, involved uh, protests against the Vietnam War. Uh, the young woman there is Mary Beth Tinker from Des Moines, Iowa, and her mother. Uh, she and some of her friends were protesting against the Vietnam War and the school board found out that they were planning this protest and that they were going to wear black armbands. And the school board was terrified about this and so they passed a rule that said nobody's allowed to wear black armbands. Uh, if you do wear a black armband you will be suspended and you can only come back to school if you take the armband off. So this case worked its way through the court system, went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And um, here, the, the, the court as it existed in 1969 was very similar view of education that the court had in the Barnett case. Um, you know, they said, in order to be good citizens, you have to have wide exposure to a robust exchange of ideas. If we have students who are in a little test tube and the only thing they ever hear are people exactly like themselves all repeating the same thing at the same time, that's not going to, re that's not going to result in good citizenship. Uh, they said it was not a legitimate goal to have homogeneous people coming out of our schools. We wanted diverse schools. Uh, and then again, they made the... Uh, made the analogy saying, hey, our schools are not supposed to be uh, little totalitarian states. Uh, students are not just there to receive what gets fed to them. Uh, they may 
choose to express things that the school uh, does not support. So the legal rule that came as a result of this view, first of all, they reiterated uh, students are persons under the Constitution. In order to punish speech by a student that happens at school, the school must show that there's a, you know, a serious problem with the speech. Okay, just wearing a black armband, expressing a view about the Vietnam War, by itself, that is not going to really mess up the day and make it impossible to teach anyone about algebra. So it isn't material or substantial disruption. And, uh, or, you know, if someone is violating the rights of others, if I go into school and uh, am, am threatening to kill one of my fellow students, you know, that, they can punish me for that too. And they really emphasized that and sort of undifferentiated fear. They said, well, gee, this black armband, uh, that might be a problem, uh, that the kids might get into fights over the black armbands. That's not good enough. You have to have some real evidence that the student's speech is going to cause some real problems. Uh, so that's what they thought about school in 1969. Well, let's fast forward a few years to a case that actually arose here in the state of Washington, uh, the Bethel School District, which is, I believe, in Thurston County. Um, There's a student named Matthew Fraser who was giving a speech. There was a school assembly. Uh, it was to nominate candidates for, um, for the student body president, vice president, things like that. So Mr. Fraser gave a speech nominating uh, his friend Jeff to be vice president. And his, uh, his speech was a little bit uh, different than what the school had in mind. Uh, he, he made some double entendres there about how, um, <clears throat> how this nominee is firm in his beliefs and he pounds it in and he doesn't do things in little spurts. He'll go to the climax. And so everybody chuckled like this. And the, the principal was not amused. <laughs> Mr. Fraser got uh, suspended from school for a week. So this case worked its way up through the system. And so what did the, uh, what did the Supreme Court do? say here. Again, we're in a, in a later time, different members of the court than we had in 1969. And they said, you know, the purpose of public schools is to create citizenship. Okay, we've talked about that before. Then they say, well, citizenship means you have to have shared values of, of, of civilization. And a school needs to inculcate habits and manners of civility. That's what good citizenship is. It's being quiet and polite and not uh, telling dirty jokes when people aren't expecting to hear dirty jokes. Uh, and that the school has an interest in teaching students the boundaries of socially appropriate behavior. Uh, so they're going back to uh, talking about schools as you know, forming people that follow a particular model rather than uh, forming people who have a particular ability to think independently. Okay, so what's the legal principle you get from this? Uh, right, if <clears throat> there's basically a rule that results from the Bethel case that a school can punish a vulgar speech and lewd conduct. And that doing this is in order to protect children, uh, especially if they're in a captive audience. Uh, <clears throat> so now let's uh, fast forward to uh, this latest case from 2007. Here is the famous uh, banner. What, what was happening here is actually the, the, the high schools in, in Juneau, Alaska, and the Olympic torch going to the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City uh, happened to run down the street where the school was. So the, uh, the principal told the teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if you want to, you can let your kids out of class to go watch the torch running by. And most of the teachers did this because if, if they didn't, the kids would just be looking out the window anyway and nobody would be getting anything done. But it was sort of a school-sponsored activity. It was, uh, it was sort of like a field trip. It was a, it was a kind of an unruly field trip. Apparently, a lot of the kids were throwing snowballs and, <laughs> and spilling bottles of Coke and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, finally the torch runs by. Uh, Joseph Frederick was the name of the student, and what he and his friends had decided uh, earlier in the week is that they just wanted to do something to sort of shake things up. They wanted to do something that was sort of funny and a little bit outrageous and maybe surreal and, and get on TV. 
because you know it's the middle of the winter. There's, you know, what else are you going to do? So they, <laughs> so they thought up this slogan, "Bong hits for Jesus," and they said, "Okay, when the cameras are coming by with the torch, we're going to unveil this bong hits for Jesus. It'll be really funny, and it'll, it'll go on TV." Now, uh, when he was asked later, "Well, what what does bong hits for Jesus mean exactly?" You know, a bong is something you smoke marijuana out of, and Jesus is Jesus, and, and what, what does this mean? And, and, and again, he said, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just supposed to be funny. And um, the, the Chief Justice was sort of forced to admit that the message on the banner was, was cryptic. Um, but, but one thing that the, the Chief Justice and a majority of the, of the current U.S. Supreme Court said was, well, one thing that this could mean is uh, smoking marijuana is a good thing. And at this school, they have drug education classes where they say smoking marijuana is a bad thing. And the, uh, so the school principal, when she actually ran out there, tore down the banner, told Joe Frederick, you're suspended for a week. And then he complained about it, and so he got suspended for two weeks. But uh, what she said when the case went to court <clears throat> and the school board was, was behind her in this is they said, if we allow the students to say things that are the opposite of what we're teaching in class, everything will be a terrible failure. You know, um, We're teaching them one thing and then they're going out and, and saying something else. And people will think we aren't serious about what we teach. <laughs> if we allow the students to, to publicly disagree with us during, at a school-sponsored event, you know, the education is, is just going to go down the tubes. And that, that was a pretty extreme position for the school board to take. I mean, they didn't try to say, oh, it was disruptive. They didn't try to say, oh, you know, this is not proper adult behavior. You know, telling dirty jokes at a school assembly, that's really not proper behavior. But this was a sporting event. Of course it's proper behavior to wave crazy banners around and try to get on TV. You know, th that's what we do. Um, so anyway, what did the, when this case came to the Supreme Court, what, what did they say about school? Well, I, I'm actually going to start by telling you what Justice Clarence Thomas said. He wrote a, he didn't write the majority opinion, but he, he wrote a separate concurring opinion. And uh, what he said is that um, schools should be, you know, the only thing that the Constitution requires schools to do is the same things that they did back in 1789 when the Constitution was ratified. Now, and Well, actually, there weren't any public schools at that time, so already he's sort of engaging in a, in a sort of speculative enterprise. But he says, well, wh wh what did the founders of the Constitution think about free speech and students? They said, look, early schools were not places for freedom of speech. Um, in the earliest schools, the teachers commanded and the students obeyed. All right? That's what the Constitution is all about, is commands and, and obeying. Then he says, the First Amendment does not protect student speech in public schools. He actually says, I think the Tinker decision was wrong. You should be able to suspend students if they wear anti-war buttons. And then he said something that I got a kick out of. He says, if you don't like it, you know, you can go to private school. Or you can homeschool, or you can move to another city. And he said, that this is the democratic system. He actually, actually, in the same paragraph, he says, this is the democratic system. If you don't like it, you can move. Um, so say what you want. At least we know what Justice Thomas thinks about what schools are supposed to look like. Uh, and the law is a result. What about the majority? This was something that was actually written by Justice Roberts, who's a fairly new Chief Justice. And compared to all of these other cases that we've been talking about, there was almost no discussion at all about what the purpose of education was. You know, he didn't write a little essay that says, you know, the reason we have schools is to create good citizens. He just didn't say anything about it. Um, you have to sort of read between the lines. And one of the things he says is, well, I'm not going to say what school is for, but I do say it's a place where the children need to be protected and they need to be safeguarded. And in fact, look at that second quote. They need to be safeguarded from speech. Okay? Speech is actually the problem. Um, and here's another interesting quote here. 
They said, look, this school is spending a lot of good money on anti-drug education, and it'll all go down the tubes if there's too much peer pressure. And we have to make give schools control over the norms in the school. All right, now what is peer pressure? Peer pressure means there's a bunch of people who believe something different than what the school administration believes. And so this peer pressure, which means you know the opinions, the non-conforming opinions of the other students, that's the problem. So speech is the problem in a school. Uh, so where do we go uh, in terms of our legal result? Well, if a majority thinks that that's what schools are about, it's a place to be safe and it's a place to be protected from the ungainly opinions of other students, you know, uh, they basically said the students can sp punish students for speech that can reasonably be regarded as encouraging drug use. Because again, there was this debate in this case about like, what does Bong Hits for Jesus actually mean? And he says, well, it might mean that he's encouraging you to smoke marijuana and so they can punish you because that's what it might mean. Now, some of the other, a couple of the other justices wrote a separate opinion where they said, well, look, we agree that saying bong hits for Jesus can get you suspended, but if you actually phrased it in a more mature and, and, and polite way <clears throat> and said, we would like to comment on the wisdom of the war on drugs, we would like to comment on whether marijuana should be legal or not. He says, you know, that, that's okay. We're not going to kick you out of school for that. But um, if you say something that might look like what you mean is, let's smoke marijuana anyway, then you can be, then you can be punished. So I um, wanted to leave you with a, a, a question, which is basically we've, we've got throughout recent history, you know, 20th century up, up, up to today, there are definitely two strains of thought amongst our Supreme Court justices about what school is for. You know, there's school is supposed to turn out people who hold certain beliefs versus school is supposed to turn out people who have the freedom to choose their own beliefs. Uh, and depending on what the justices think the answer to that question is, that will affect the rules that we all have to live under. Now the justices, you know, where do they get their ideas about what makes a good school? Well, there's nothing in legal education that teaches you that. You know, I went to law school, we didn't spend a semester like most of you are doing about what is the theory of public education. They're just members of society. Now, and so in order to sort of convince our judges that we want our schools to look a certain way, you basically need to try to get more of a consensus among society as a whole of what kind of schools we want and that will eventually trickle upwards uh, into our decision makers. Uh, so thanks for your attention and uh, look forward to hearing the other speakers. Hey, I think we're going to just go through uh, all of the presentations and then we'll have all kinds of questions coming from you. Um, we're going to now go from that legal structure and go right inside a classroom and take a look at what all of this means for teachers. Uh, Val Hartley. Can you hear me? I should say that I'm probably the least experienced at giving presentations to large groups, so I'm imagining you're all 10, and that's going to help me get through this. Um, I've been teaching for five years in my current job, and our school joined, as Lorraine mentioned, the League of Democratic Schools a few years ago. And as we did that, I think as a teaching faculty, we really didn't have much of an idea of what that would mean terms of what we thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. You know, how bad can that be? We're all kind of for democracy. Um, but we didn't really have a vision of what that would mean. And now as I look back at it, I remember being, I came to teaching late in life. I got my teaching certificate five years ago. 
Um, and I remember reading books about democratic education and democracy in the classroom. And I had this vision that it meant something like that the kids would get to choose what they wanted to learn, this kind of free school model. And I just, I thought, students are going to be running the class and it will be chaos. And <clears throat> what would I do? How could I figure out what, you know, make sure that we t um, learned what the kids were supposed to learn? Um, now I've learned, at least for me, that I'm still running the class. Order prevails. Um, but the kids have some say in how we do what I know we need to get done. So that's kind of my piece of democracy and voice in my classroom is the students have a say about how we do what we do and a little bit of say about kind of what we do. But it's mostly about the how. Um, kind of hearkening to what Aaron said, this idea that various iterations of society's views of democracy and education, um, some of the, the things I've read talk about, um, for instance, we teach reading, writing, and math by having students do them, but we teach democracy by lecture, for instance. And kind of as a motto, he, uh, one of the people that I've been reading says, we, let's have education for democracy, but be careful about democracy and education. And I think both of those, and I have references you can pick up later, um, kind of sum up the problem. And as I listen to you, I realize that this is especially a problem in elementary school. I mean, you can talk about the problems of freedom of speech and so on in high school, and high school students are about independence and making decisions that are controversial. But elementary students have less power than anybody. I mean, they are really expected to buy into conformity and do what they're told and sit down and be socialized and raise their hands and line up and all that stuff, all of which I expect from my students as well. But um, I do give them opportunities where that isn't what I expect, and that's really what my article was about. Um, so for me, uh, themes in my, my classroom environment include voice, so my students have a voice. Um, another theme is the tension between freedom and responsibility, which I think is a central theme in democracy. Um, and the other has to do with the whole concept of classrooms as democratic worlds. That when children are young, their worlds revolve around their families. And everything their families do, the church they go to, how they eat dinner, who their friends are, who their parents' friends are, that is their world, and they understand that. But when they move out into the larger world, that's where school is, and that's where most of them for the first time experience diversity, diverse opinions, different kinds of food to eat. There are books written for kids about the kid with the stinky whatever liverwurst sandwich and what they do with that. I mean, this is diversity for a child in many ways. So the question kind of comes, how can you use that rich classroom environment as an opportunity to teach kids the values and dispositions um, that we want them to get in a democratic world. Um, and a lot of those ideas, if you're interested, come from Walter Parker. There's a lot of writing about democracy and education. And I've copied um, some copies of references here. I made about 50 copies. So later on, some of you are welcome to pick these up. Um, also, if you want to give me your email, I'll um, email you a copy. And if you get the article online, it has a reference list too. This has a few more things in it. but um, So I really feel that as educators, our long-term goal is to help our students gain the skills and experience required to become effective citizens in the adult world, and in their worlds too, um, where they are today. Um, in my article, I open with an example of the power of classroom meetings. And I need to say, I have some video clips. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I have a series of little clips which demonstrate some students working through some of the problems that, we, that I present or they present to themselves in our classroom meetings. The one I'm going to describe briefly is not one I have here, and it was actually the first year that I tried teaching classroom meetings in the model I use. Um, and briefly, um, what's different about how I do class meetings compared to virtually everything I've seen written about class meetings is I use a complete consensus-based model so that whatever we're talking about in order for something, a decision to be made or something to be changed, it's 100% consensus. Um, and we have a voting system. The kids get to vote zero through five, with a three being, it's not my favorite, but I can live with it, so it's a pass. And a five is you know, full support, and zero is no way. So whatever we do, we vote when we're ready. We have kind of a modified Roberts Rules of Order thing. Um, we call them proposals instead of motions and some other stuff. But 
um, they vote, and anything below a three is a no vote. And then we have a kind of a protocol that if you, anyone's child can stand in the way, if you will, of a decision of the whole class. I call it the power of one. That one is the person in front of the bulldozer kind of model. But with that power comes a responsibility to explain to the class what, what the problem is so that we have an opportunity to meet that person's needs. So it's kind of that freedom and responsibility. You have the freedom to, to stand in the way and the responsibility to explain to us why that isn't working for you so we can find a place to meet you. And just briefly, um, my first year that I tried this, the, every year the kids want a class pet. I don't know if you've ever been in a classroom, but that's a big deal. Every year the kids want a class pet. So we were having this discussion and it finally came down to a vote and this one boy voted against it. And the whole class was like, oh, come on, you know, give us, what are you doing? And they were, well, blah, 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 blah. So I finally, you know, I was relatively new at teaching and I'm trying to think of what can I do to, you know. So I'd heard about this idea where you line the kids up as a continuum and you can put the ones that are really in favor at one end and the ones that are really opposed at the other end and the rest of them space themselves out and then they all get this visual model of, you know, where they all are, blah, blah, blah. Well, I did all that. And this one little boy had his, you know, back against the wall over here and the rest of them are kind of all along over there. So I said, okay, so here, everybody, here's what we got. This is what it looks like. So you, you now have to tell us. You have to convince them, you know, explain to them what, what your problem is. And I try not to say problem because that's kind of pejorative language, but I will here just for shortcut. And he started to talk and he said, well, you may not know, but my family is are vegetarians and so we don't eat meat and we don't believe in, you know, doing anything about harming animals. And he talked about that for a while and then he said, in addition, even if you're not going to kill and eat animals, I have really strong feelings about locking them up in a little box, even if it's just a hermit crab. It will have to live in a little box. And I think, and as he talked, one by one, everybody went to stand by him. And by the time he was done, I was in tears. I mean, I just, I mean, it sounds funny now, but I was so moved. I'm crying just thinking about it because um, to me, when you open up, you know, your world to students being authentic. And that's one of the caveats I have. You can't go to the places I go unless you're willing to really let the students lead you. And you end up in places that um, is a really honored and treasured place to be. And I don't think they all realized how I felt, but I've carried that with me as my first powerful example of where you can end up when you really let students have a way to talk to each other. Um, sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Um, other things, so that's kind of the opening example in my article, but briefly some other things. Um, in order to create a space where students will talk to each other, briefly there are a number of tools that I use. One of them is something called the Nurtured Heart Approach, which is an approach to classroom management that helps um, students find successful choices and take away some of that negative energy. So there, I could talk all day about that, but I won't. Um, another thing is changing my communication style to level out the power difference between me as the teacher and them as students. And to help with that, I've taken a little bit of nonviolent communication um, training. There's a whole protocol about how to communicate without a power shift. And also, I just wanted to, um, a little bit, I don't know if you're familiar with William Glasser. By the way, the Nurtured Heart is, um, Howard Glasser is kind of the shaker and mover. He's the psych psychologist, I think, from Tucson, um, and he's written a new book called The Inner Wealth Initiative about the nurtured heart in a classroom setting, which I highly recommend. But William Glasser has spoken in his books um, for a number of years about kind of five basic needs that people try to have met. I think it's, he calls it choice theory. And the one that he describes that students have the least access to is power, that we all have a need for power, and that students have virtually no access to power in an authentic way in the classroom. And so, you know, he says if students don't feel that they have any power in their academic classes, they will not work in school. So, I mean, that's a basic problem. If you're trying to get them to do anything, it's about, con you know, convincing them that it's in their own best interest. So giving them power is one of the best ways to get there. He envisions teachers as modern managers willing to share power in order to reap the rewards of students willing to work harder. And I think that's just essential. So that's one of the things I've kind of worked on. Um, let's see, so 
let's just launch into class meetings. So one, what I do at the beginning of the year is I introduce the concept of class meetings to my students and I spend the first few month of the year or more um, explicitly modeling how I want class meetings or how I expect them to be run. And I have a number of um, kind of goals of my own. One is because of this idea of having students in their own democratic worlds, they have to have things to talk about that are authentic to them. And that's another way my model differs. It's not about me and making announcements about blah, 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 or what I think a problem is with blah, 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 blah. And it's not about, I mean, that's good in some ways, but we do that elsewhere. And it's not about sit in a circle and give compliments to each other so that we can you know, have the touchy-feely nice. I mean, that has its place too, but that's not what I use class meetings for. To me, class meetings are a place where students bring their own problems problems that affect the group, that they need to find solutions for. So instead of coming to me and saying, Mrs. Hartley, everybody's taking pencils and I can't find any pencils, which sounds really trivial, but I mean, we could have a class meeting for two weeks about how to solve the pencil problem because it's not my problem, it's important to them. And so I am constantly on the lookout for issues that matter to them as fodder for class meetings. So we have an agenda on the wall and they can add stuff to the agenda whenever they think they have a problem, and they do. Somebody will come in and say, God, at recess, and often it's recess stuff. Um, I can't believe, ram, 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 ram. somebody said, well, go put it on the agenda. You know, and that's where it starts. Usually at the beginning of the year, they don't know each other well enough to know what problems they're going to have. So I own the agenda at the beginning, and the first thing that we tackle is class jobs. Because I start with a clean slate every year and say, yeah, and there's a lot of work to do in this classroom. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of work on my plate already. So we got to figure out how to share what happens here. And so we brainstorm a list of class jobs, and it's just hysterical. Sometimes they want, they want litter police, somebody who's going to walk around and pick up the litter, and they want, you know, line leader. They've also had experience with line leader, bathroom monitors, whatever. Um, <clears throat> and so here we go. So here's my first clip. Um, I have to say about the video, um, it's terribly difficult to video and manage students in a class meeting at the same time. Um, so the video quality is a little sketchy. Lorraine's been after me, Dale, I want some clips to put in the journal and have them write in your article and somebody could, and she even lent me a graduate student one year to help me take, and it's still, they're sketchy, but better this than nothing, so we'll try. Um, the first one is me at the beginning of, and also these are meetings over a couple different years, so the students may change and life changes, but. So this is me at the beginning of the year explaining to the students about consensus. Just, oh, stop, stop. All right. Um, this is a little cumbersome, but we're going to try it. Um, and you'll notice I have small classes, so you can ask later about how would this work when you had 50 kids. I don't know. But. It's important to me that in our classroom, everybody can buy into what we do. So that's kind of my definition for 10-year-olds about consensus, a way to make everybody happy to some extent. Um, the other thing I do in class meetings, another thing, is teach, actively teach the kids meeting management skills. And my um, kind of metaphor for that connection is when you're sitting in a meeting, how many of you have been in meetings where people blather? How many people of you have been in meetings where somebody will go on and on and the next person says, you know, I agree with them because I've had that and basically repeated what the other person just said and you listen to it all over again. So I am trying to teach my kids how to be effective in meetings to actually get something done. And so what you're hearing in the next one is, um, for instance, tips about managing an agenda. Okay. And you'll notice I start to tell somebody, no, we shouldn't do that. And then I back up and, because I'm trying to model brainstorming. I don't want to judge this idea. I just want to give some additional information. So you'll hear me change my language as I'm aware of what I'm saying. boy was saying, well, let's just start at the top. And I'm saying, well, okay. Um, 
then the next one uh, is modeling that. I think that was okay. Um, how to agree with somebody who's already said something. I think that was probably a good idea um, because, like, yeah, four needs to be clean. And I'm kind of with Olivia, too. I'm kind of with Olivia. Okay. Um, another, what Nadia just modeled for you was if someone said something that's exactly the same as what you wanted to say, instead of wasting the group's time by repeating the exact same thing again, you can just say, I was going to say the same thing that Olivia just said, and I agree with her. And then the group understands that there are two of you that think the same thing. Now, I have heard people that say, you can't teach this to 10-year-olds. And I'm saying, you can. And I stand up there and say, I am explicitly modeling for you, because this is something that is useful. This is why it's useful. And this is why you, know, you should pay attention and try to do it, too. And I tell the students at the beginning of the year, by the end of the year, every one of you will be up here doing what I'm doing. It is my expectation that you will all lead class meetings. And they all go, ah, my gosh. You know, by the end of the year, they're begging for second and third turns, every one of them. So um, um, let's see. One of the things that, I don't know how many of you have worked with children, but one of the things they're doing all the time is waving their hands. So this is. Um, our accommodation for that. I won't make this one bigger. Um, but you can see that what they do is wave their hands and the, the class meeting leader, is in, he has to manage all the people waving their hands. And so we use initials and they write down initials in the order in which we see them and then the kids can put their hands down and relax and know that they're going to get a turn in turn and they don't have to be concentrating all the time on waving their hands around. And sometimes if the class meeting leader can't really manage all that, he can get a volunteer or a scribe to kind of do it with him and they do it together. Um, but that's one way to just manage all the people. Um, here's this little gal is kind of in the saddle, so to speak, and she's managing the agenda. She's asking everybody, okay, here's our agenda. This is from last week. What do we think is important this week and so on? So they're telling her, you can erase that one now. It's not important anymore. And he's adding something else. So they actually do learn to manage the agendas. I have, um, if they're in the front of the room, on the back of the room, I have a whole list of what the protocol for class meetings are. You know, you do this, you do this. Yeah, somebody has a proposal, you have a discussion. So if they, you know, they can look up and get clues about what they're supposed to do next. Um, I want to get to, <laughs> okay, another hot topic in my room is one year, um, I had a planning time while they were out at PE in the mornings three times a week. And I would usually have hot coffee or tea or something. And they would come in from PE and say, well, well, and our school doesn't have a gym, so they go out in the rain all year. Um, and they would come in and say, wow, wow, you have hot chocolate, you have hot tea, you have, we want hot drinks too, it's not fair that you have something we don't have. So I said, fine, put it on their class meeting agenda. So we had a series of meetings about the idea of the students wanting hot drinks too. And so I thought, well, okay, I'm willing to try that, let's see what, where we go with that. So the first year we invented a protocol for having hot drinks, and now every year it's a rite of passage moving into my class that we have hot drinks. But what they don't understand is that they have to invent their own protocol for it every year. And every year it looks different. So this particular year, um, the students that were there, we had a couple kids who would not wash, did, would not agree to wash their own cups. Because, and also in the class meeting, I am just one more voting member. I don't have any teach, I don't get 10 votes for each of theirs. I don't get two votes for each of theirs. I get one vote, just like they get. And my role usually, once they're trained, is just to sit in the back and I take notes and kind of help them remember from one week to the next what to do. But um, So I get to kind of put in my two cents worth. So this particular year, I, I do, they know that I won't allow them to use disposable cups, that because of the environment and so forth, we have to use real cups, which requires washing cups. Um, so this particular year, this one little boy was not going to agree to wash cups. That just, he'd never washed dishes. By fifth grade, he'd never washed a dish and he wasn't about to start. 
And so there's a series, what I have next is a series of a conversation between two boys. And why I picked this is you can, part of what I'm after in this class meeting protocol is that deliberate um, deliberation piece where the students actually listen to each other, hear what each other have to say, and come to some better understanding of what their needs are so that they can reach a decision together. So you'll hear these two boys, and I'm going to have to play it in these little clips. I'm sorry I don't have it continuous in a movie, but this is, this is the best I could do. Um, and the one with the long hair is the one who's refusing to wash cups. The, the dark-haired, short-haired boy, what you'll hear is um, the long-haired boy at one point says, well, you're asking me to compromise, and I don't want to compromise. And you'll hear the other boy say, well, I had to. And I'll tell you more about what happened later, but you can listen to them. Okay, so the dark-haired boy is, is trying to ask the long-haired one, and the dark-haired boy is off camera right now, but what, what is your problem? Tell, tell us more about why this isn't working for you. The one in the background is the class meeting leader. He's using my little bells to try to get their attention because he sees this argument. He's trying to assert himself, and he's not very good at it yet. But, um, but the conversation, this one's saying, well, why is it hard for you? I don't know why it's hard. I didn't create myself. And then the other boy says, you're just being frustrating. Now, to me, that's pretty good communication. I mean, don't we wish our spouses could get that close? I mean, sometimes about, yeah. So this is good. Um, then... <clears throat> Okay, and this is the boy who was talking earlier. That maybe it was your turn to do it, you and Tyler could do it together. So it's not as hard, even though I think it's one of the simplest jobs. <laughs> <laughs> a solution. He's making some suggestions. He's a little bit sarcastic. And the other boy says, you're supposed to be convincing me with kind words. Um, so but what's interesting is, I mean, the one boy is saying what he needs and what's working for him. And this kid is being very persistent because he really wants hot drinks. So he has kind of his own motivation. Um, what is the thing that? And I like his solution of you can have a friend to help you. I mean, maybe that would work for you. So I think he's being pretty creative at trying to find a solution. What is the entire thing that's best? What is wrong? What is wrong about it? What is the fact? What's the thing about it? I don't want it. Why don't you? Another thing is, you have, in the beginning, you, there were a few things you wouldn't budge about. And I'm not talking about one thing I'm not budging yes, about. But and you act like it's the end of the world just because I'm sticking up for myself. kind of stepped in and did his thing there quite loudly. Um, what was interesting, part of what's interesting to me about that is the long-haired boy is saying, hello, you did this earlier in the year. There was something you wouldn't compromise about. And I'm doing it now, and you're telling me it's the end of the world. And then the other boy said, but I did compromise about the library. This kid earlier, somebody wanted a library job about putting books away or whatever. 
And he was like, no way. He was all about kind of a libertarian. Everybody can just put their own books away. We don't need to have a librarian. And he was the one person, the power of one, standing in with everybody. He was new to our school, and he was really kind of experimenting with personal power in this new school. And people were looking at him like he just didn't get it. But he, I mean, we, we went through that process with him. And now he's turning it around and pulling it on the other kid, which I found really interesting at the time. Um, so, and here we go. And now this is me coaching. One of the things I do is stand on the side, and when necessary, I step in and help the class meeting leaders or other students. I coach them about, you know, where, how can they move forward from where they are. So this is me coaching. Okay, so you don't like it when he does it, but when you did it, how did that feel? Well, I kind of felt special in a way, but kind of made the compromise. Yeah, it did. So he's, he's admitting that it made him feel special when he was the one that stood out and got the power and all the attention. And I think he had, can kind of see that that's what the other kid is doing. But he says, I did make a compromise. And I said, yeah, you're right. I mean, I confirmed that. And here's I can make a compromise then. <laughs> yeah, so this is. I can make a compromise then. How about our table leaders do it? Table leaders. So now it's, he doesn't want to do it. He wants the table leaders to do it. But because um, one of the things to try to groom leadership, I have the kids sit at tables, and table leaders have jobs and responsibilities. And so he, ultimately, this group decided that every child would wash their own cup. Nobody would agree to wash the group's cups. They didn't. They all. This group had to go one by one. Everyone did. In the whole year, I lived with unwashed cups sitting all over the classroom. But that's okay. It worked for me. Um, you know, you kind of have to flex. If I really am going to let them go there, I have to make some compromises too, I've learned. Um, and then just a couple other things. Um, there's one about someone restating. I won't go there. Um, here's what a vote looks like, just for fun. Um, so she's calling, getting ready to call for a vote. And I, I have to say briefly, one of the things I've discovered, and I was talking to Aaron about this earlier, I, I have kind of an ethical quandary occasionally because my students, one of the, the topics they bring to class meeting is complaints about other teachers. And professionally, that's a little bit of a sticky wicket. Um, and they do that because the other teachers actually don't listen to them. And they know that when they bring an issue to me, I will listen to them. And part of why I do that is because, because I'm trying to further all these democratic ideas. Um, and the other teachers are really content driven and they don't want to give up the time to do any of this other stuff and they pay the price ten times over in just behavior problems in class because they don't take the time to listen to the students. And so within a school community it's a little tricky because even though we belong to this democratic schools movement we aren't all implementing it the same way. So the students get different ideas about what they should be allowed to do or what they're encouraged to do and then they go to another environment and they're not allowed to do it there and they struggle a little bit with that. Um, in this particular class meeting, what they're talking about, they're, they're passing a proposal about how to behave in another teacher's class and the proposal is basically, will be respectful <laughs> um, and try to give this teacher credit for you know, teaching us what that teacher thinks that we need to learn and if you don't like it, you ought to at least try it. And So some of them are coaching each other on um, respectful behavior. And here's, and she's going to call for a vote so you can see what it looks like. So she said vote zero to five. So you see threes and fives and Okay, so as people were voting, you heard one little girl almost on the verge of tears. This is her issue. She said, I don't know because this proposal doesn't cover it. And I'm coaching her. If it, it doesn't work for you, then you have to vote a two or a one or a zero or something. And then you heard the class meeting later saying, okay, you and you, we need to hear from you because you didn't vote a three. So she's coming back around and saying, what is it about this that's not working for you? And then the last thing um, that we do is have a, we have a debriefing session at the end where the class meeting leader is invited to share his or her experience of being the meeting leader, what worked, what didn't work, what they found difficult and easy or hard or whatever. 
and then members of the class give that person feedback and one of the things I ask for is direct and specific feedback. You can't just say you did a good job. You have to say I like the way you restated what other people said. Um, it felt like I had to, it took a long time for me to get my hand up. I mean we, positive and negative, it doesn't have to all be positive but it has to be very specific. Um, and here's just a little, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to stop us. Um, Okay, I'm going to stop us. Um, we're out of time. We need to prepare for lunch. Um, what I want to do is just do some debriefing here for a minute. And debriefing looks like this. Okay, first of all, Kern talks about what his experience of being class meeting leader was and shares what he learned, what he found easy, what he found difficult, what he liked, what he didn't like. Because he went first this year. He was brave enough to do that. Many of you haven't done this yet. So you can learn from his experience, and he can share what he thought about what happened today. Okay, I, we don't really have any footage of the kids. This child is not very articulate, so he didn't say very much. But um, we do that every class meeting. They, this class meeting leader speaks, and the rest of the class gives, gives feedback. Um, so that's briefly kind of what class meetings are about. And then just the last thing I would just wanted to kind of tuck in, other things that I do um, to kind of further what I think of democratic principles include um, Socratic seminars, which is a, another strategy that a lot of people think is high school and college only. And um, there's a couple different models out there for it, and I use it in a number of ways in my class. There's an excellent book called The Habit of Thought that talks about class meetings. Um, related concepts are junior great books, shared inquiry, and the Padea model of um, Padea seminars. And um, other, uh, in, interestingly, I don't know how many of you are doing your, well, not yet because you're students, but after you get out, you have to go through your professional certification program to move from a resident certificate to a professional certificate. And I just did this last year, I finished. And about 80% of my portfolio <laughs> was built on class meetings and Socratic seminars as a way to demonstrate effective teaching. The rest of the people in my cohort looked at me and said, where are your reading assessment scores? What are you going to do about teaching how to write scientific conclusions? What about teaching your kids to solve math problems? And I just started out, I, I understood from the program how to start out with um, pre and post data and all that stuff. And I used a lot of um, the students' kind of own opinions about Socratic seminars, their ideas about class meetings, and kept um, lots of data and samples of their work, and I was able to use that for my um, professional teaching portfolio. So don't think that if you go down this path, it means you have to make compromises in content. Um, and I guess I just would like to close with, again, kind of a caveat, that if you go down this path, there's, there are resources you can find out more. It's difficult. It's not what you think you, you'll end up with. And um, let your students lead and have a conversation with them because they're the best teachers of all. So thank you for your time. Okay, we heard about a lot about voice. Um, Aaron talked about voice in terms of student rights in the legal aspect. Uh, Val talked about voice in terms of children's empowerment in a classroom. But there's one uh, hidden voice in all of this dialogue. There's one hidden voice in all of this uh, dialogue, and that hidden voice actually has uh, that hidden voice has actually surfaced just recently in the uh, presidential uh, election, uh, in the uh, 
public dialogue that went on with uh, Barack Obama and his uh, his uh, uh, pastor, uh, Reverend uh, Jeremiah Wright. And of course, that hidden voice in American democracy is race. Um, I just wanted to share one line with you here from uh, Barack Obama's uh, speech on race uh, in Philadelphia that he gave in, in March. He said, the issue that has surfaced over the last few weeks uh, reflect the complexities of race in this country that we're, we've never really worked through, a part of our union that we have not yet made perfect. And if we walk away now, if we simply retreat into our respective uh, corners, we will never be able to come together and solve our challenges. Understanding the reality requires a reminder of how we arrived at this point. And then he quotes from William Faulkner, who said the past isn't dead and buried. In fact, it isn't even the past. Uh, Bill, I know that in your article, uh, you look at the very fundamental contradiction of democracy when it was first formed in this country and how race became a, a, a way of uh, responding to those contradictions. So uh, let's move then to this whole issue of the hidden voice in our democracy. Thank, thanks, Lorraine. And, and uh, before I start, I'd just like to mention, somebody told me today's Lorraine's birthday, so I think um, we should say happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, in, in my essay for this, this issue of, of the journal, um, I started with the, the, um, the controversy that Lorraine laid out at the beginning tonight, where the idea of how can we school as if democracy matters in the age of the Patriot Act? And, and two of the things that seemed implicit in that is the idea that the Patriot Act is somehow worse or different or that the, the times we live in are less democratic than the times, you know, than other times in our history. And also the idea that uh, the, of the traditional moral imperative for democracy that, that our schools are supposed to have. And I wanted to look at that a little bit in history and take both of those terms and and historicize them and talk about democracy in history and and certainly uh, we all deal with uh, we all we all talk about the Patriot Act right now uh, I think it's important to recognize that there's always been some version of the Patriot Act around it almost since the beginning of of the country um, the alien various alien and sedition acts various uh, foreign agent acts, things like that have always been around to to create certain kinds of controls. And democracy has never generally been available for those who live in the neglected regions of capital, those who are disenfranchised by reason, reasons of class or race and, and excluded from access to all of the things that, that, that we're holding uh, self-evident in, in the charts that we had for this journal. So, and you see that the way that people abuse those various kinds of acts as the way in which we know that democracy has never really been available for people below the middle classes. Um, John Adams abused the, the Alien and Sedition Act repeatedly to exclude people um, who, who were disenfranchised. He only got in trouble for it when he put Benjamin Franklin's grandson in jail. Um, you know, Richard Nixon regularly ab abused the Constitution, killed hundreds of thousands of people in South Southeast Asia, and yet the thing that he gets kicked out of office for is bugging the headquarters of other ruling elites. Okay? Guantanamo sits down there and, 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 and the, the kind of torture and the kind of abuses that have taken place under the Patriot Act regularly go on every day for people who are disenfranchised in, in this society. And the things that someone like Alberto Gonzalez gets in trouble for is not his justifying or, or, or allowing 
um, torture, it is that he fired a bunch of people who were already occupying pretty uh, elite uh, places within the society. Um, that, that, you know, the thing that Karl Rove gets in trouble for is not all of the abuses that are directed toward social control, that are directed toward keeping the disenfranchised disenfranchised. What he gets in trouble for is punishing members of his own party. Um, and so the idea, if, if, if we approach this with the idea that, that um, Dick Cheney and, and, and George Bush adjusted for inflation are no worse than John Adams or J. Edgar Hoover or Joe McCarthy, I think we get a better sense of what we really mean by democracy traditionally. Okay? Democracy was never intended for people you know, outside of the, the, the confines of, of the bourgeois middle class. Um, at the same time, uh, I think that we need to, to understand schools and what place they play in our history. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I was responding to in my essay is an, is an essay by Henry Giroux that is the lead essay for this I issue, right? And he makes, and, and Giroux is, 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 is a very smart guy and, and, and has done a lot of really interesting stuff about education. But he makes the, the, um, the argument that since 1980, schools have become little factories, have become little places uh, to, to count up you know, what's happening, places to funnel people toward uh, you know, various militarized corporate sorts of things. And all of that is, of course, true. But he goes on to say it is time for us as educators to take our schools back. And uh, it's easy enough to understand who or what he wants us to take our schools back from, but what he thinks we should be taking them back to, it seems to me, is a little bit harder to understand. Um, compulsory public schooling in this country grows out of two things, the, the first one being the anxiety of Protestant elites about the, the growth of Catholic schools in the 19th century, with, with, with Protestant ruling elites getting worried that, that American citizens would become somehow more loyal to a pope than a president. And the, the second thing in, in the 20th century is the reforms in terms of child labor laws are directly coincident with also the imposition of compulsory public schooling. That it, it, it's easy enough to understand compulsory public schooling as a response to the problem that is created by making it illegal to lock the children of the disenfranchised into factories all day. If you cannot um, um, put those kids to work, you need somewhere else to warehouse them. You need somewhere else to keep them under the control of the state so that they aren't available for, for any kind of, of real problem. And so I think that if, if you look and, and, and I think we saw this in a lot of the Supreme Court decisions that, that Aaron was talking about. If you look at the way that schools are generally understood in the history of the United States, they are places where we deliver skills. You know, we, we teach people rudimentary things like reading, writing, arithmetic. We teach them things that will make them available and valuable as employees. And we also indoctrinate them into certain. I mean, all of that stuff in the in the Supreme Court decisions that that I think you were showing shows that that um, this is the place where where we we uh, in, inculcate various ruling class values, especially in the children of those people who are coming from the disenfranchised classes. Um, that you know, Columbus discovered America. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. World War II was a good thing. Martin Luther King has made it so that race isn't a problem anymore. Those are the kinds of things that generally we learn in school. And 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 in the in the essay, uh, I sort of uh, rely a little bit on the the Marxist uh, theorist Louis Althusser and his idea of an ideological state apparatus. I think it's important to recognize that schools are institutions of the state. And so it is, it is um, dubious of us, I think, to expect that institutionally 
schools are ever going to be the engines of real democracy or real reform. And, and the analogy that I use in that is an analogy, analogy with, with uh, participation in electoral politics. Um, in the months leading up to the 2000 election, um, I ran around to all of my liberal friends preaching the radical gospel. I said, look, um, you must go vote for Ralph Nader. You know, George Bush, Al Gore, they're the same deal. Put them in a bag, shake them up. They come out the same. They get their money from the same place. They're the same guy. Uh, you know, they both weren't the brightest students. Yak, yak, okay? In, in, in very quickly, in the, the short months following, you know, the Supreme Court's installation of George Bush as president, I had to go around to all of those people and apologize and say, okay, look, you're right, this guy is worse, okay? That, 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 that it does indeed, you know, make a difference which spoiled white son of the ruling class is in charge at whatever particular time. And, and I think that's right, but I think it also shows the limitations of participating in those kinds of state institutions, okay? For the, um, you know, for the kinds of change, the kinds of reform that I was advocating in saying you've got to go vote for Ralph Nader, voting doesn't matter. Okay? If you, once you're participating in that particular liberal institution of the state, your choices are this bad guy or this worse guy. And any other choice is romantic and stupid. Uh, that that, that, that if, you, if, you, if you want to create that kind of reform, you need to get outside of that institution. And I would argue that the same thing becomes true for schools, um, that, that, that schools are indeed always going to be institutions of the state that are going to be about inculcating ruling class values in the people who show up in them. And that if, if we're genuinely interested in radical change that's going to bring about true democracy, we need to quit our jobs and go do something else because this is not the place that it's going to happen. And the, 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 the example, the big example in the essay that I use about schools as ideological state apparatuses is an example from my own discipline. And it's the example of the creation of the canon of English and American literature. And, and, it, it, and I apologize, a, ACS 204 is in the house tonight, and I sort of ranted at them about this last week, and I apologize for repeating myself. But it is the question of Beowulf. Did everybody, somebody make everybody here read Beowulf at some time in their school? The reason why you had to read Beowulf in high school or junior high school has everything to do with race, okay? Literature is a relatively new discipline in schools. Um, literature curricula were developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and they were developed primarily to train the middle classes of, of the British colonial empire in places like India, and to train the working classes in places like Great Britain and the United States. And when when people like Hippolyte were creating the various canons and curricula of English literature, what they were trying to do was to provide to people who didn't necessar weren't necessarily born into knowing this that all things Anglo-Saxon were the best. Okay? And so when you set out to create the canon of English literature, you obviously have the classics of Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Milton. Everybody says, yeah, these are the guys. This is, this is what shows the genius of, of literature. Yak, yak, yak. Um, when he looked for a beginning to that tradition, instead of looking back to Greece and Rome, which would be the obvious antecedents of those writers, of, of people like Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Milton, instead he looked back to a relatively obscure Old English text um, that was purely Anglo-Saxon and that would be Beowulf, okay? The Greeks and the Romans were far too Mediterranean and swarthy for the tastes and for the purposes of creating indoctrinating things in, in, in colonial India or somewhere like that. Um, and so they chose Beowulf and they chose it strictly for racial purposes so that you could have a purely Anglo-Saxon beginning of the great and glorious tradition of English literature. Beowulf 
did not matter one iota to Chaucer, Shakespeare, or Milton. It was, it was not only text that they didn't read, it was in a language they couldn't read. Um, that it, 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 by all of the usual standards that we trot out for why we pick literary texts, Beowulf should never have been on the syllabus. And yet the hangover of that is that it persists today as, as the starting point of the tradition of English literature. And you see this play out in the last 20 or 30 years with all of the things that we call canon reform. Okay? And, and because of the demographic changes in at the end of World War II and in the 1960s, because of the GI Bill and the uh, Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Movement in the 1960s and 70s, you get an influx of people into college who have generally not been allowed there in any significant numbers before. Okay? And you suddenly have lots of people in college saying, I can't read no more of this John Milton. You, know, you are bringing me one book after another that neither looks nor sounds or acts like me at all. And you get a lot of political pressure for a different kind of canon. Okay? You get a lot of political pressure on the reasons why that canon was developed, saying, you know, look, it's probably more than just a coincidence that in the Beowulf to Virginia Woolf canon, um, everybody is white and there's only two women. Okay? Um, and and the, the traditional answer of, well, we can't help it that it's fallen out that way, this is just the best, is no longer working okay, for, for, for those students. Those students grow up to be college professors and bring us the canon wars that we all hear about in the op-ed pages in the 1980s and 1990s. Okay? That's when everything changes. That's when George Will, every once a month or so, says you know, the death knell of civilization has sounded. We have all these crazy lefty professors. They're making people read Zora Neale Hurston instead of Shakespeare. This is the end of Western civilization as we know it. Okay? And the, once that canon changes and once the principles on which that canon changes, under which the canon was made, get called into question, it, starting in the 80s and 90s, you can no longer count on English departments to do the job that they were invented to do, which is to produce good little racist misogynist citizens. Okay? That is no longer, I mean, you're, you're much, that, that's no longer something that, that you can reliably count on English departments to do. And what has happened in English departments since then is indicative of the way that the, the institutional state apparatus adjusts to, to being outrun by those kinds of events. Since about 1990, budgets for literature instruction and cultural studies instruction, especially in non-elite institutions, especially in institutions where you can't count on um, getting, getting the students of the ruling classes who, you know, you can preach Marxism to them all day and that's not a problem because, because they're just, they're not the revolutionary class. Um, but in, in non-elite institutions, there has been tremendous pressure directing budgetary money away from the study of literature and away from the study of culture and toward creative writing and technical writing. Okay, a huge growth in both creative writing and technical writing. And, and what both of those uh, programs do is, am is, is, is amenable to state interests. I mean, the one produces self-involved esthetes, the other produces employees, okay, and produces you know, people with skills, people who can write the labels on Viagra bottles and stuff like that. And, and so uh, it, it's, it's, it's that kind of... of institutional uh, force, I think, that we're dealing with when we talk about inculcating real reform or inculcating real democracy in schools. And so in the second half of the essay, one of the, the, what I go on to talk about is what it is we can actually practically do. I mean, I think that, that Giroux's is, as smart as that guy is, I mean, his, his final conclusion that what we need, he, he's got a lot of sort of platitudinous statements in his essay about, you know, what we need to do is, is make our classrooms spaces of, of this and that and the other and radical democracy and taking things back. And, and, and I think that in some ways, that becomes as historically uninformed and as romantically dumb as my beating on everybody to vote for Ralph Nader. 
um, that, that if you are going to choose to participate in this institution, in these institutional arrangements, it seems really important for us to recognize the boundaries of that institution and, and, and understand them as genuine and real. And so I, I, I go through some things that, that we can do individually as teachers in, in these institutions that are always going to be ideological state apparatuses. And the, the two main things are the one, to recognize exactly what Lorraine's talking about, to recognize the voice that is never ever heard in these places, okay? The voice that, that and, and in the few times that it is heard, immediately gets squashed. And the example, one of the examples I use is the example of Ward Churchill. Everybody knows what happened to Ward Churchill, that he got fired for writing the essay after 9-11 where he said all of the people in the Twin Towers were little Eichmanns. And everybody, it, the, the, the Ward Churchill thing is a lot like what's happening to Jeremiah Wright now. I mean, that, that if you listen to Jeremiah Wright in any extended way, Okay, I mean, admittedly, maybe his timing isn't great for, for Obama and stuff like that. But, but if you just listen to the guy or you read the full transcript, the stuff that he's saying makes perfect sense. I mean, it, 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 is, it is not outrageous or should not be dismissed out of hand that the way that it has been. The same thing was true with Ward Churchill. Ward Churchill was making what is a relatively banal point, okay, that... that, that the 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 uh, the people who died in the twin towers, excluding the people who were there to clean up or serve the food or something, all generally participated in a, a, a state apparatus that created the conditions for that kind of terrorism to be part of what we live with. Okay, the place where 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 Churchill probably didn't go far enough was in looking at himself and, and encouraging us to look at ourselves, okay? That no matter how committed we are to certain kinds of freedom, certain ideas of democracy, certain ideas of justice in the world, we are, the minute we walk in this door, also little Eichmanns. We are also participating in an institutional apparatus that is designed to keep the world divided into haves and have-nots. And rather than trying to deny that, rather than trying to, to um, ignore or suppress that, I think it's important with our students to confess to that, to admit that up front, okay? to, to um, engage it in a way that allows us to, to talk about it and to talk then not just about what we're doing as individuals, but the way that the institution itself is arranged and deployed and keeps certain voices in and certain voices out. Okay, it keeps, I mean, the, 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 one of the, the, um, the, the, a former student of mine created uh, the, the series here, the Civil Controversy series, does everybody know about that? And, and, um, and the, w they invited me to one of the things where uh, we were, Dinesh D'Souza was one of the debaters that night. And I, I went to a class and, and, and you know, we were all talking, and, and, and a lot of the principles of this was, you know, we must remain civil, we must talk to each other, we must, and, and I sort of ended my thing by saying, look, Dinesh D'Souza is an idiot. Um, he is, is, you know, uh, without honor and unworthy of honorable attention. And, and that was suddenly deemed out of bounds. I mean, the, the, you know, that's violating the civilness of the civil controversy. And, and, and the, the, it reminded me that there's a place in, in James Baldwin's uh, book, No Name in the Street, where he talks about hanging out with all his liberal white friends um, as they debated endlessly, you know, whether or not Joe McCarthy was okay or not. And, and he writes about this and he says, look, coming from the place where I came from, coming from the place, the, you know, the disenfranchised regions of this country, listening to this pe these people talk in this kind of way just made them sound like imbeciles, okay? I mean, the, 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 there was nothing more to say beyond Joe McCarthy was a bully. Okay, Joe McCarthy was a dishonest bully. And continuing to parse 
the nuances of whether this was okay or that was okay, was to simply participate in, in the way that, 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 um, that, that certain kinds of obvious truths get excluded from our classroom discussion. You can see this again, I think, in the way that Jeremiah Wright gets treated today, okay? We are happy to stand up on TV and call him names all day long, okay? Even though nobody's paying attention to what he actually says. We are happy to hold Barack Obama, the black candidate, responsible for that guy, okay? We did not hold Milt Romney responsible for some of the horrors of Mormonism. We do not hold the other Republican candidates responsible for it when they go visit Bob Jones. I mean, nobody takes the kind of beating because of somebody they might have sat in church and listened to, no matter how horrible they are, that Barack Obama does. And every time you try to address those kinds of statements and those kinds of people, the same way that we're addressing um, the, the uh, Jeremiah Wright right now, Okay, you're suddenly out of bounds, you're uncivil, you're too loud, you're too angry, you're too, you know, th this is not the place where we do those kinds of things. And I think that starting to show the contours of that and starting, starting to show how race and class bound those kinds of, of behaviors, those kinds of rules, and those kinds of institutional arrangements are is extremely important. It's, some, it's a small thing, but it is a thing we can do within this institution. The second thing, and the, the thing that, that I end the essay with and I'll end with here is, is, is the, with uh, uh, apologies to Senator Obama, um, the, the, the notion of perhaps encouraging uh, our progressive students to give up the idea of hope. Um, that, 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 that becomes uh, one of the, the, um, the again, the, the thrusts of Henry Giroux's essay is talking about schooling for hope and a politics of hope. And, and I think in some ways that can be extremely destructive. Um, that if you take a clear-eyed view of the historical arrangements of this country and you're coming to it and you're saying, I want to end racism or I want to have justice in this country and you look at the history of this country up till now and you look at the arrangements that we have now, and your goal is, say, to end racism. It seems to me that the first thing you have to admit is that you're going to die a loser. Okay? Racism in this country is not going to be eradicated in my lifetime, in my children's lifetime, in my grandchildren's lifetime. Okay? Um, and that, that seems to me just a banal and inevitable fact. If you say... I give up the hope for that ending, you also get to give up the flip side of that, which is despair, okay? The, 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 the trajectory of hope is that every time you're coming along and saying we need these kinds of changes or we need racism to go away or we need misogyny to go away, when people come to you and ask for real and genuine answers, the only thing that you can talk about in a global way is to, to wax uh, utopian or say, I don't know, okay? If you give up hope, you also get to give up despair, and then you have to find a new reason to get up in the morning. Okay? Then you get up in the morning every day knowing that you're going to lose, and knowing that losing becomes an indication that you're probably doing something right. Okay? And, and that, that uh, you have to see uh, the dignity and honor and purpose in actually doing the work, not in the teleological notion that it will end in victory, because certainly in our lifetimes it, it won't. And I think that, that, that giving up hope and, 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 and speaking to our students in, in honest and practical ways about that kind of rhetoric um, is about the best that we're going to be able to do in, an, in institutional spaces like this. Uh, um, thanks.
Hello? Oh, good. I could probably work without this, but I've been told we need to for video purposes. Um, that's a good question. I have people say that you just there's not enough time to do this. We have class meetings one period a week, 45 minutes. So it's not, I've seen models of 15 minutes three times a week. We do it just one regular classroom period in most cases. Sometimes it gets preempted by art or something, and sometimes we'll have an extra one um, if there's a, some kind of a crisis in the classroom or something, but usually one period a week. Yeah, uh, the question was, what do we think about uh, school dress codes? Um, I think there's an obvious problem uh, with a dress code if if what we're trying to do is have a have a situation where you know students can say what they want so long as it doesn't actually cause a problem. And um, there's lots of things you can express that won't cause a problem. But the the school uniform, you know, just says, no, here's the only thing you're about to say. Yes, we, there's a whole range of things that you might say and that might not cause a problem, but we're not going to allow it uh, because there's just less arguing. You know, if, if we generally let people wear what they want and only go after people when there's a problem, then the people who are causing the problem are going to say, oh, well, gee, you're letting everybody else wear, wear what I want, and you get into these arguments. So we're just going to have one uniform. So th that's where the reasoning comes from. I think uh, that's you know, throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater. Um, now, in terms of a, of a legal question, the times that school uniforms have gone into court the courts have generally said, sure, these it's fine to require a uniform because uh, most of what people wear doesn't express anything. You know, the courts are sort of willing to say, well, if you have a T-shirt that has some words on it, okay, words express something. But you know, if there's a school uniform that says you're going to wear black pants and a white shirt and you want to wear a green shirt just to express your individuality, well, you aren't actually expressing anything. A green shirt doesn't express anything. Well, you know, look around the room. Of course our wardrobe expresses something. You know, I'm up here in a coat and tie, and other people are wearing different things. It all expresses something. But uh, as a legal matter, courts have been, uh, I think, sort of willfully closing their eyes to that and just sort of saying, oh, well, you know, uh, they want to wear different clothes, but that isn't an expressive choice. Therefore, the school uniform is okay with us. <laughs> this is uh, Vernon Johnson, by the way, who team teaches American Cultural Studies 204 with me. And
So what do we leave them with? You, know, you, you talk, you kind of, kind of speed it up at the end. What do we leave them with so that they can do something better? With the idea that that doing progressive work is a good end in itself. I mean that that when when even even when you're saying you know that that we want their generation to do better um i i i just don't think there's a lot of evidence that that any generation has done better i mean that that again you're 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 sort of grounding that in this sort of teleological and progressive notion that things are are continually getting better and 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 as you say i mean i think there's there's a tremendous amount of evidence right now that lots of things are worse and um that and and i guess what i'm 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 suggesting is that when you reach the place where you say i can't imagine any genuine Practical answers to the giant problems. I mean, this, this, this. I mean, I go around and say the stuff that I say, and 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 inevitably, someone comes and says, "Well, okay, what should we do? What should we do different? What what's the answer? What's how how do we fix this? You know, how do we fix the horrors of racialized capitalism for the last four hundred centuries?" And 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 the choices you have there are either to wax into a kind of Obama-esque um, sort of utopianism of we're the people we've been waiting for or something like that, or, um, or say, I don't know. I mean, that, 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 that given the, the, the social, economic, and historical arrangements that we're dealing with now, there is no answer you can give to that question that is not just utopian. And so, the um, what 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 I think that that you're trying to prevent there is is the disappointment that that you I mean you look all of the the '60s radicals who grew up to be stockbrokers, I think are the example that we want to uh, counter to to say you know you don't want to have that happen to you you don't want to to get to your 40s and say, gosh, this isn't working. You know, I, I keep losing. I keep, you know, and, and, and all my friends are driving fancy cars and buying houses and, you know, I want enough money to buy a pizza on the weekend. And, and so, because the temptation then becomes to, to tell the story that, that all of our parents said to us when, when, when we were 20 and they were 40 and say, well, that's cute. You know, your radical ideas, your hope is all good, but someday you're going to grow up and have a mortgage like me, and then you'll know that not only is it, is it inevitable that this is what is going to happen to you, but that it's somehow right. And I think that, that, that that's what we want to prevent is, is look, and, and it's kind of like being a little Eichmann in an institutional setting like this. If you admit that every day you're making all kinds of compromises. Every day, you know, yeah, you might grow up and get the mortgage and all that kind of stuff and have to pay the what you know the light bill. And as long as you're 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 talking about that as a genuine compromise rather than a change to something better, rather than having gotten over your naive and youthful hope and understanding that really um, poor people are poor because it's their fault and, and stuff like that. Um, that, that that's the kind of thing I think you're trying to prevent. You're trying to prevent the, the disillusionment and despair and, and the, the very strong forces that come at you um, when, in, in terms of trying to, to force you to stop articulating what's genuinely and obviously wrong. With the society, I mean that 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 and and and, and that 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 force is extremely powerful. I mean, the, the, I, the one time I was giving a talk, like the talks that I give, you know, everything is bad, 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 and and <laughs> and and then some guy afterwards got up, he stood up, and he said, "Well, you know, you've told us how everything is bad. Now, what are you doing to fix it?" 
And I was immediately on the defensive. I was immediately, you know, well, you know, I'd take soup to people with AIDS. And, you know, I'd, and, 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 and in the middle, I, I caught myself and I said, look, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you about what it is I do or don't do. But it could be that I just go home and eat greasy fast food on my couch watching corporate television all night. That doesn't make what I'm saying any less true. And, and the, the, the pressure that we get to be perfect before we're allowed to speak and the pressure that is, is I think, on especially younger people to, to live these, these sort of uncompromised lives that are impossible in a compromised world force people to say, well, maybe, you know, maybe, the, uh, you know, maybe the obvious wrongs that we can see on a daily basis before our ten antenna have been fried in some irrecoverable way, um, maybe that's not true. Maybe it's okay to get a job as a stockbroker. Maybe it's okay to you know, live in a big house. And then you're looking the other way at people on the side of the road when uh, wanting money and stuff. And, 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 and uh, so that's, I mean, that's not a lot maybe to offer, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Ab yeah. Absolutely. And so, and there's, there's legions of them. Indeed. And probably, I would argue, I think that most of those people have at least unconsciously um, come to terms with dying losers. <laughs> <laughs> and they, but let me say, they might choose to put it differently. Yeah, may. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they might. Yeah. <laughs> The title of his um, article was not Dying Losers, but Beautiful Losers. Right, <laughs> now. Well, on that note, um, unfortunately, our time is up this evening, and I know there were um, several people who would like to um, speak to our panelists. I'd like to, um, before we end this evening, I'd just like to formally say thank you to Lorraine for this 10th anniversary tonight. So let's give Lorraine a big round of applause. educational pluralism have a gift for you tonight for being our mentor and also for um, continuing to do this work um, even in dangerous <laughs> and uh, hard times. So thank you for being, and happy birthday. Panel. Let me thank the panel and uh, uh, all of you for coming. Uh, do take a look at our, our issue. We have a lot of other articles. And uh, let's try to get below the surface on some of these issues and really think about what we're talking about and what it all means. Thanks again for coming tonight.